time, but I guess um, to begin, just um, thank you for hosting me um, t tonight or today, I guess, um, depending where you are in the world. I really appreciate it. Um, I know there's a lot of people that know me quite well with, with the group. Um, so um, th thank you especially to Kimberly as well for reaching out um, as well to invite me. And also it's, it's cool to see that some of my connections have actually um, come through uh, the, um, the the Kia uh, the college and system as well. Um, so Casper and Ruben have both reached out to me and uh, let me know that they've actually studied here as well, which is which is really exciting to know. So um, it's good to good to sort of connect some of those people in the world and, uh, and make a bit more sense of my network because um, there's quite a lot of connections in it. So it's nice to nice to know how they all sort of tie together sometimes. Um, so in this case, um, I guess if anyone hasn't met me before or um, seen me before, my name is Gavin Crump. Um, I've got an architectural background in the industry. Uh, so I've got a bachelor's and a master's, and I've been working in the industry for about 10 years now in Australia, um, uh, typically working as either a BIM consultant, a BIM manager, or a BIM coordinator. Um, I did start my background as more of an architect and sort of found my way towards BIM quite early. Um, I, I realized quite early that I actually really preferred BIM um, to, uh, to architecture itself. I really enjoyed what I could do by uniting those two things together. Um, having said that, you know, I really do appreciate, um, you know, the, the work that architects do and how we can support it um, by using building information modelling um, and also just seeing projects come together and teams, you know, really um, enjoy the solutions that, um, that, you know, BIM consultants and BIM managers can, can help assist them with as well. Um, but I guess now I work as a BIM consultant at uh, my own business, BIM Guru, so I've really enjoyed um, that journey. Um, now, I will present on a, just a few sort of, uh, sort of subtopics tonight, just a few things that are of interest to me. Uh, currently in my career, I'll focus on mostly on um, some things related to Dynamo, uh, mostly just live demonstration and a few um, things that I just want to show people that people might not necessarily have seen before in Dynamo, mostly relating to um, user interface and user experience um, and how you can better customise your scripts to make them more usable because I found in my career lately that's been a, a big interest to me. Um, and I might also touch on Rhino Inside and compare it to Dynamo a little bit just right at the end um, just for people that haven't seen that before. Um, so a lot of you probably know me from um, from YouTube, um, my, my channel that I launched about about two years ago now, the Aussie BIM Guru, um, which has climbed I think past 16,000 subscribers now, so it's doing really well. Um, it's been a really fun way for me to share my knowledge with the industry and, and watch a lot of people sort of get more well connected as an overall BIM network. Um, there's a lot of other people out there like me, like some people might have seen say the Revit Kid before, um, that really inspired me to give back a lot of my knowledge um, to the industry around me. I did feel I was sort of um, locking away a lot of my knowledge. And whilst I guess I was working with a lot of um, closed BIM platforms, um, I wasn't necessarily opening my knowledge. And I felt that that was at least that the least that, that I could do um, to better my industry. It, it turned out to be a really good choice uh, for anyone that's looking to become a consultant. Um, you know, having a public persona is super valuable um, because essentially it means you, you have an outward facing marketing persona as well. So it's been a great way to sort of connect both my work as a consultant, but also just my passion as a content creator as well. Um, so I cover a lot of different topics. I'm um, ranging from Revit to Dynamo, Grasshopper, Python, Navisworks. Um, and I, I sort of just flick between the topics as I choose. Um, I will be developing a course platform in future, which will be a little bit more focused. Um, but I do try to make two videos a week and we'll aim to do so for quite a while. Uh, I've got some pretty fun Dynamo videos coming in, up in future as well. People have probably noticed I've taken a bit of a break um, and went more towards Rhino and Grasshopper and Rhino inside. And whilst I really do enjoy these platforms, I am also looking at, um, at these. I've just got a, a notification noise coming through my computer. I assume everyone can hear me. Just wanted to make sure my sound had an um, cut out for some reason. Cool, excellent. Perfect. Good, good. <laughs> um, but I guess I also work as a BIM consultant. Um, so it's not necessarily something I recommend that um, people jump into straight out of university, um, but it is a really viable career pathway if BIM is your passion. Um, I do get a lot of people reaching out to me just asking about, um, you know, the everyday life of being a BIM consultant and how they might potentially go down this career pathway. Um, so feel free to email me um, from, via my YouTube channel if you have any, any questions about how consulting works and how you might potentially be able to look at this way. Um, it is really rewarding because you get to work with a lot more businesses, um, not necessarily just with one firm. Um, at the same time, I work as a sole trader, so I am limited by just the scope of what I can take on from an insurance and a time perspective as one person. Uh, but I do plug in as a sub-consultant to some, some larger consulting bodies. Uh, to make up for this. So it's a really interesting lifestyle, very dynamic. 
Um, if anything, it really tied in quite well to my um, my YouTube persona as well because I was quite free in what I was able to express once I became a consultant because essentially uh, really the only person that can sue me that I work for is me <laughs> and I'm, I'm definitely not going to sue myself because I'll just be paying my legal fees. <laughs> um, so so it's been a really good move. Um, I do focus mostly on um, focusing on Revit and Dynamo as technical platforms and solutions, but also I do quite a lot of strategic input. Um, I do have a, a fairly decent understanding of IFC and OpenBIM requirements, even though my software doesn't necessarily uh, get very close to them too often. Um, I do know that it's definitely more uh, more popularized and, and more well used in the European regions, but unfortunately Australia is not, not um, I, I guess, fully open in terms of how they use BIM and a lot of that comes down to client and government demand. Uh, but I do find that that is becoming a more common service to um, strategize how companies can potentially set themselves up for the future of, um, of what software might be down the line and learning more about open standard schemas. Um, but at the same time, I do a lot of proprietary system development as well. So a lot of templating, um, a lot of uh, just setup of systems and content systems and just building Dynamo scripts and occasionally Grasshopper and Rhino Insight scripts as well. Um, so yeah, I keep myself quite busy around all this, um, but it's always really nice to come and present to, um, to, uh, to groups of people like this um, and sort of share my knowledge. But I guess I'm also expecting that Whilst I'll present to you a little bit, it would be great to see, um, I guess, what you all get up to as well. Um, I, I'd, I'd ask Kimberly if it's possible to show some samples of your work to me. I'd love to just um, just observe how you how you work as well and how you learn, and and then we can do some Q and A at the end as well. Because I'm sure some people probably have some um, some questions for me. Um, anyway, so like I said, I mostly work with Revit and Rhino 3D, but I am pretty aware of all the other packages out there as well, and really supportive of them as well. I think it's great to have diversity of choice in the industry. Um, you know, if we all worked in just Revit, obviously programs would never move forward. Um, it's good to have uh, a lot of different programs to keep each other fairly competitive, uh, but also that give people uh, many ways of working and many ways of collaborating as well. And in between this, it's good to see a lot of open file formats um, and schemas becoming more commonly accepted and embraced by various aspects of the industry um, to see, see better ways for us to work together. So I do use a, a fair bit of Celebri um, not just Navisworks, and I do enjoy some of those alternative ways of um, of working together, even things like BCF file viewers. Um, but I guess I'd probably just start um, just by focusing on some ways that I've been ex experimenting with over time, but really revisiting lately about how um, we can make uh, visual programming more accessible to the basic user in a company. I feel that um, a lot of what I do on YouTube is obviously fairly advanced, um, you know, not necessarily where a beginner would begin uh, with coding. And uh, I, I've been doing a bit of sub consulting lately with a fairly large company, about 300 plus people um, in Australia. And I have um, had to sort of relearn uh, the various steps that I can use to not only package a script, but also to make it something that someone is comfortable uh, to learn from as well. Um, so I have sort of went back to some of my base principles and I've really enjoyed um, the opportunity to share some of these techniques with people. Other BIM managers, for example, have come to me and said, oh, I heard you were, you were looking at ways to deploy, but not only deploy, but just to encourage people to look at scripts and understand them and, and, and interface with them. Um, so I thought I'd take an example of a script I used from a while ago and just revisit it um, sort of from the ground up and then show you sort of how far you can potentially take interfaces, but also user experiences. And then look at um, custom package development, sort of show you some of what I'm doing with my own Dynamo custom package. So an example of ways that you can sort of capture and make those things more approachable to, um, to a standard user. Um, so in this case, looking at scripting UI and UX, but not necessarily just the scripts themselves, but ways in which they can be used, run, um, interfaced with, and various little user interface tips and tricks that I've sort of found are quite, um, quite powerful. So in this case, um, I'm just going to be focusing mostly on one of my favorite Dynamo scripts that is probably actually the one that saved me the most time in my career, um, at least while I was working on projects, and that is to batch apply revisions to sheets in a Revit model um, all at once. Because if anyone's actually done this task manually before, you will know it's not only really, really slow and manual, but also very boring. Um, it's something that I probably wasted a lot of the early part of my career having to do on large projects uh, before we had uh, more capable add-ins and things like Dynamo that could streamline this task. So I've actually got um, Dynamo open in a project and I was probably just gonna jump straight in and do a technical demo. So in this case, I'm just in a, a fairly fairly sizable project. This is actually a remake of um, a project some people might recognize, the, um, the Autodesk uh, Advanced Sample Project. Um, obviously I've 
you know, fixed it up a little bit, made it a, a whole new model, <laughs> essentially. But um, but it's a full model. So in this case, I believe, I think I've got some links in here that aren't showing up at the moment. But um, it, it is essentially, it'll be coming to a course platform in future. Um, I do have a free sample project as well that I might use at some point. I think they might be on good work sets actually. Yes, that's why. But it's really a, a full remake of this this model that a lot of us um probably either either know and love or or know and hate <laughs> depending how we've used it um so in this case it has i think about maybe 50 50 to 60 documentation sheets in here overall and um they all have a, a title block with a revision block on them um that we use to track um when we actually issue uh, these these documents um so in this case i've only got one one revision currently applied to these sheets um if i did want to add a new revision to all the sheets i would usually need to add a new revision to the project, um, which you know is already you know quite boring, um, and then you know I'll just I'll just mock up a revision date and just say uh, revision two. So when I first began with this type of workflow, I did actually experiment with a few um, what I would call you know basic user interface techniques. Um, I'm probably just going to remove some of these just so they don't get in the way. Um, they're not currently being used, I think. While I'm here as well, it might be worth pointing out to, uh, I'm not sure how many people here are using the um, the ISO 19650 or the um, National Annex Revisioning Standards. This is actually a system I tried experimenting with before Revit 2022 came and revised the way we can use revisions, um, where I was actually using the issued to and the issued by to represent the status um, and, and all the suitability and also the revision using the issued to and the issued by field. Um, a very you know strange workflow that I, I sort of concocted um, to, to get around the fact that Revit couldn't really deliver um, this sort of system. So that's why um, the revision fields are a little bit a little bit out of order. Um, but anyway, I'm going to add a new revision to the project. And every time I want to add a revision to a sheet, I have to go to this dialog inside the sheet properties, tick on this box, and now I have this revision added to the sheet. If I want to do it for another sheet, I keep doing it over and over and over again. If I have 500 sheets, 1,000 sheets, it's going to take me 500 to 1,000 times longer than that. One of, one of my favorite things about Dynamo is if you can take a task and you can turn it into a, a structured task where you can run it across any number of elements, that task can become almost infinitely scalable. Um, if you can find a way to solve a problem for three things and then just increase the number of things, um, usually the time you will save is just immense. Um, so this script has saved me a lot of time on projects. Um, I think when I first began with this script, um, I was working with what's called a sheet set. Um, so I think I do have a, a node in this model that can collect sheet sets. Um, I'm just I'm working in my, my custom package here. Uh, I'm just trying to recall if I had my sheet set available in this particular package. I might not, um, but in this case, I think in this case, I might use the ORCID package for now um, just to collect a sheet set dropdown. Uh, so this is a custom package in this case. So it's already, um, difficult in this case to use because it means a user has to have a custom package deployed. If anyone's used the ORCID package before, you'll know it's not necessarily the easiest package to install for the first time. It does have an executable. Um, I am just going to go and actually add a sheet set because currently I don't have one. Um, so I'm just going to create a new set with all the sheets, except for a couple. And I'll just save this as a sheet set called uh, set. And I'll just okay that. Um, I don't actually want to print this, but I'll keep the sheet set. Okay, so back in um, back in Dynamo, I'm sorry, I, just, I need to keep pressing the start button because I can't currently see um, see the uh, the start menu while I'm running Teams, which can make it a bit tricky. There we go. So now I should um, should be able to see that sheet set, and I think in this case um, we can get the views from the sheet set. Now I'm, I'm pretty sure I did have a a views in sheet set node in my custom package um, that I made the other day. So just bear with me while I do look for it, because um, it is quite a new node uh, in here. I believe it's maybe in the selection set. Ah, oh, it's annoying. I, I won't spend too long looking for it. I, I only really just added it to my to my custom package quite recently, so I don't want to spend too long looking for it. Um, but in this case, I think um, no, I'll probably just I'll use this one for now. I think get view from sheet set. So I think in this case, this returns all views inside the sheet set. Um, so now we've essentially found a way to collect some elements together um, because it's very hard inside an environment like Dynamo to explicitly pick a set of elements back in the Revit model. Um, so already there's a challenge in that we're sort of being forced to work within uh, the Dynamo environment if we work with a script in this way. 
Now, in this case, I'm going to be working with a node um, that essentially was inspired from the Arculab package. Um, but in this case, I have just uh, changed it a little bit. Um, I'm going to be using these add revision and remove revision nodes. Now, when I first built this uh, script, I wasn't really thinking about the way that someone would need to use it. I'm going to switch to manual mode, but what I was really focusing on was just adding revisions first. Uh, that was sort of where my headspace began when I first did the script. And I actually built two versions of the script. One was to add revisions and the other script was to remove revisions. And I already sort of um, was missing, I guess, an opportunity to make this a more user-friendly script. Um, as well as this, I also need a, a ability to pick a revision in the model. So for now, I'm just going to get a revisions dropdown from the ORCID package in this case, um, but there are other ways we can collect revisions as well. Um, so this lets us pick just a revision from the model. And finally, in this case, even in the Arculab package, there was a, a Boolean that triggers the, the node to be run. Um, now, I didn't understand why this was in the node at first, but having revisited this workflow in future, I really came to understand the value of this portion of the node. But now I'm just going to say um, run me is just true. And essentially, this will just take a revision and apply it across um, the sheet set, which we've already set. So I can now take um, this revision two, and I should just be able to apply it to all the sheets. And I've essentially just went and taken a task um, and scaled it across um, essentially every sheet in the entire model. So now I've went and applied that. Um, now, the next thing I looked at was I said, well, OK, I want to remove these now instead as well. Um, so my, my first mistake here was just to go and create two scripts instead. Um, I didn't really think hard enough about this. So I could just say in this case, add revisions was my first step. And I essentially just went save as remove revisions because my thoughts were I could just create a little toolbox, um, with, you know, more than one tool. And sure, this does work in principle, but I've already created a bit of a user experience issue um, in that users have to go between two different scripts that might not necessarily have the same input selected. So they, they can't necessarily just undo what they've done, for example, um, unless they remember the exact inputs that they picked at the time. So what I can do now is essentially just run the process in reverse and take it off the sheets as well. Um, but then I sort of really understood that there was actually something staring me right in the face, which was that this run me command was actually quite powerful. Um, and, and it got me thinking harder about the way that custom nodes can function and how creative we can make them. Because this, this run me doesn't actually have to be here. We could just run a custom node like this um, and just say that we just want to run it if the inputs are provided. Um, for example, if I do look at this custom node um, in the Python script, it's essentially got a, a Boolean. And somewhere in the script, it's just saying, if this is true, then run the node. Otherwise, just send a message saying that the, the node hasn't been run, essentially. Um, and not that many custom nodes are built this way. Um, typically, we build them just to be run if the right inputs are passed through them. Uh, but what I realize can be done is if I take both of these functions and I connect um, both of these together and I also connect the revision. But in this case, I assume that this Boolean input has more meaning than just being a, a run me. In this case, let's say that true is to add and false is to remove. Um, I can actually give this a lot more meaning. So I can say that when it's true, it's going to feed through a true to the run me on the add. And what I can do is just use a, a not node in this case. I can flip this Boolean. So now it's false when it's true and it's true when it's false. And I can choose when the remove and the add are run, essentially flipping that relationship. At this point, I still hadn't really looked at ways to package the scripts for users in what we call Dynamo Player. Uh, but this is essentially the step where I sort of unlocked that this, this was the time to actually make it a Dynamo Player compatible script. Um, I was using some different methods to collect the sheets at this point as well. I'll show you one that I used that um, was sort of a good idea at the time, but sort of became a worse idea as I, as I went further in. But um, now I can essentially just flip that relationship. And now I can see that when the add run it runs, the, the, the other one doesn't. When I set it to false, this becomes true and runs the other one. So essentially false becomes the remove. So I now have a bit more of a toolbox built into just one script. Um, I guess one hard thing at this point is I do remember some users were trying to learn from what I was doing here. And already by adding a little bit of logic in the script, this was a little bit more difficult for them because now we're introducing a bit more computational logic to the way things are functioning. Uh, but what you could, what you can do at this point is just essentially right click some things that are inputs. And of course, I'm going to rename this Boolean so it's more obvious uh, what it means. So I'll just say add 
equals true and remove equals false. So at this point, I was pretty much ready for this type of workflow to be um, be run via Dynamo Player. Um, so what I might do in this case um, is I'm just going to probably save this in the same folder. One of these actually is going to be the final script of where I reached in the end, um, which will show you a couple more techniques. Uh, but in this case, I'm just going to call this um, add or remove for player. And for the people that I guess haven't seen Dynamo player before, I'm sure probably most of you have. Um, in this case, it's just next to Dynamo. And we use this very commonly in practice um, to avoid users having to open uh, Dynamo itself, um, especially if they're new to Dynamo or they're not comfortable uh, actually working with Dynamo, which is more common than a, a lot of BIM managers would like to like to expect. Um, for example, in a 300 person company, I would say there's probably about maybe 15 to 20 people that I know are comfortable opening Dynamo um, and probably about 45 to 50 that are comfortable opening Dynamo Player. Um, and beyond that, most people are quite hesitant to, um, to interact with the program at all because they feel like the moment they do something wrong, the model's going to blow up. And sometimes if the scripts are built wrong, that, that can happen. <laughs> but in this case, I have at least built in um, some inputs that are quite clearly identified for the user. I'm just going to copy a path to Dynamo Player. And because I've identified those things as inputs, now I can create a much more well-packaged script. Um, but there's still going to be some problems with the way that the script behaves. Obviously, we're still using a lot of custom nodes, which is something that really we should be targeting to minimize in our script altogether. Um, but I do have the ability to pick my sheet set. Um, remembering that a sheet set isn't necessarily always the best way to collect a set of sheets because you may not want to add the revision necessarily to a, a entire sheet set of the document, or maybe you just don't, aren't using sheet sets because maybe you're printing using something like a batch printer. Um, so this isn't necessarily always the best way to do this. And that's one thing that we'll try to solve uh, by looking at a user interface. Um, so in this case, I can pick a revision, uh, leave it on true to add, and we can now see the impact um, in the model as we run it. We now have essentially a toolbox. Um, now, there were some things I didn't like about this. One is that the user technically doesn't know when the script is finished, um, except for the fact that the script really just shows them um, it's finished just by, by finishing the play cycle. But a lot of users will just be really confused when Dynamo doesn't even tell them what's happened. It just, it just says, I'm finished. Um, so one thing I did explore quite early after that was actually adding messages to Dynamo scripts. This is one thing I, I find I'm nearly always doing in um, just about every Dynamo script I make these days, it does add effort into building the script itself, but I find that it's really valuable. So often I like to tell the user like what has actually happened. Like have we added something? Have we removed something? Um, it gives them feedback on what the script is doing. So in this case, um, I'm actually just going to get an if node, and I'm just going to firstly get whether we've added or removed something as a word. Um, so in this case, I'm going to connect my Boolean to if. And I'm just going to create a code block in this case just to save some space, but I'm just going to get two strings. And I'm just going to do a, uh, I'm going to say space added to space. And I'm also going to do space removed from. So we can say what's actually happened um, in both cases, because when it's true, we're adding. When it's false, we're removing. Now I'm also going to count um, the number of things that we've done something to. Uh, this is a little bit more difficult in this case. Um, in this case, usually I do just go back and count the number of sheets that we ran it across, even though we do have branching pathways, because we know that the, the node should typically work. Um, now, this is the point where you might, might want to build in some things like error handling, because sheet sets are a little bit difficult, because you can actually technically put views in sheet sets as well, but views can't hold revisions. Um, so there's definitely some, some error handling you might want to build in at this point if you want to be absolutely safe. Um, it's a fine line between, I find, um, how much you want to protect the script from being run incorrectly uh, versus how much you just rather train people to run the script properly or give them guidance videos and warn them along the way. These are things you need to consider. Um, in a big company, it's a fine line because you obviously want this thing to be scalable and trainable really quickly and easily. Um, but at the same time, on large projects, if something is used incorrectly, uh, the consequences are obviously much more um, disastrous as well. So lots to think about. Uh, what I'm going to do now is just count the number of sheets um, that I'm applying these to, and I'm just going to assume they're sheets in this case. Um, so what I might do is just uh, freeze this portion of my script. And I find this is really handy when I'm testing just to really only focus on really small parts of what's happening. Now, this is currently a number, um, not a string, but we want to add it to a text message. So I'm going to turn it into a string. Now, sometimes I do find 
that numbers don't actually convert to strings. Um, in all cases, sometimes you might end up with a really big trailing decimal point. Um, I eventually decided to build a Python function that solves this problem. Um, so if anyone does run into this problem, in my own custom package, I've got a, um, a generation node, I think it is, under string, um, which essentially just turns um, a number, a rounded number into a string with a specified rounding distance. So in this case, I can take a, a set of numbers, specify the rounding tolerance, and it will output the string version without any trailing uh, zeros in this case. Um, but I'm pretty confident in this case, usually an integer um, in most cases can convert quite, quick, quite cleanly. Um, so I am going to just leave it uh, as the string from object node for now. Um, so from here, I'm just really building a user message. Now, how am I generating the message? Um, well, I did actually build my own node eventually, um, just so the Python code was exposed. Uh, but I used to use a, a node in Rhythm, um, in this case called simple, I think it's called simple user message, uh, that essentially expects a caption and a message. Um, I ended up rebuilding my own uh, quite recently um, in my package on the application uh, UI Messenger, um, which has a title, um, the body text, and something that you can pass through the UI uh, once the user hits OK. Um, so I'm essentially just generating a simple, a simple interface using Python in this case. So I am using um, the task dialog object um, in this case in, in Python um, and also in Revit, um, just to generate a message with a OK uh, that, that the user can select um, that will sort of pause the script. It's a little bit like a package called Data Shapes, but a much more basic uh, implementation of a, of a user interface um, just to say what's happened. So typically I'll, I'll need to build a message now. So I usually just say um, this is, you know, script has been run is the title. Um, for the message, we need to just build it out of a few pieces of what we've done. Um, so we can say in this case, um, revision has been, and this in this case, we're now gonna, we're now gonna call on that action what's happened um, so i'm going to add action as a variable just it's just going to be a placeholder for a variable name um, now it's also worth being aware when you type in various things inside things like code blocks and python um, that sometimes there's better words and better things to use than others uh, which are less likely to clash uh, with namespaces and names of variables that already exist notice here for example it's trying to get me to use the word transaction if I use the word transaction, it's actually not going to let me make it a variable because it has meaning in the context of that code block. Um, often uh, I'll just use a letter um, for a variable or maybe um, one thing I'm learning is a lot of developers will actually do something underscore something. That seems to be quite a common syntax as well because most variables and functions and methods, so most functions and methods, I haven't seen one that contains an underscore in its name before, which seems to be a good way to sort of protect your variables from clashing with a namespace. Remember that Dynamo is still being developed, so you might sometimes be using a variable that one day might become an actual used word. So you have to be careful with that. This actually has become a problem in a few custom packages. Um, there's one called Steam Nodes, which I know a lot of nodes actually suddenly stopped working for in one build of Dynamo because they were using a, a keyword um, that suddenly became reserved. I think it was element um, that they used and that became reserved uh, in the inputs of a, of a custom node. Um, so I'm just going to say action. And in this case, um, I'm going to add just a small string. So I'm going to say two space. I'm just going to say how many space sheets. And this should hopefully build um, a fairly meaningful message here. So I've got my action and my number. And in this case, um, whoops. And I don't know some people have probably um, uh, probably done this sort of thing before. So but I really wanted to just show, show something that hopefully speaks to a lot of people that are trying to package something in a more meaningful way. And I will go to the full the full user interface version in the end. Um, but I find that this is a really essential step so that when the script is actually run, um, we, we're told what happens with the script. And this is essentially the last thing that happens in the script. Um, so this is the last thing the user sees before the script is finished. And I can see that my action in this case is the, the true outcome. And if I go to false, we can see my action will now be the, the false outcome. So you can construct sort of sentences out of pieces of actions. Um, so this was sort of, um, I guess, like a, a you know a starting point. Um, obviously, after this, I really looked into, you know, fairly advanced um, user interface creation in Dynamo. Probably the best that we have available is a package called Data Shapes. Now, rather than build the entire user interface here now, it's probably easier just to show you, um, in this case, what what I built instead, just because there's quite a lot to it. So in this case, um, you can see that data shapes, it's not the easiest package to learn. 
Um, I do have some videos on YouTube about it, um, but really the way that this custom package works, you can just see it here, is um, we're just trying to generate a user interface to start our script off. After this, um, we get a list of outputs, depending on what the user picked, which lets us move forward in our script um, to, to finish off the script, essentially. So if I go back a step, um, we're essentially building buttons in our user interface or sections of our user interface. Um, in this case, for example, one of them is our revisions. So in this case, um, we can see I'm building a dropdown. So the user can only pick one in this case. Um, we're getting the revision uh, by element type and also just the names of all the revisions. And in this case, we work with what's called keys and values. Um, keys being what we, um, we show to the user and values being what we pass through in the background. So we can pass like very raw data formats behind the scenes, um, things like elements that to the user wouldn't make any sense um, because all they would see is element and the element ID. Um, so they don't know what they're picking. But in the, on the surface level, they're just seeing the keys, um, which is quite important. Um, I'm doing things too, like generating a list view of all the sheets in my project. Um, but you can see that rather than just showing them the sheet as an element, in this case, I'm deconstructing it and building it into a number colon name. So the user can see something that makes sense to them in Revit. Um, when they go and select these things in the interface. And finally, I'm just building a Boolean, again, doing that same add or remove, um, in this case, true or false. Um, and then collecting these into my user interface. And from there, I'm really just running the same, the same script again, really, um, just building my user in interface message and just using my not gate um, from my, my second or my, my index to output um, to either add or remove um, the outcome. So I'll probably just run it from Dynamo Player um, but I found that all these steps are, you know, really crucial in the way that I'm, I'm building my scripts now for people just so they can actually have confidence um, that what they're doing is not only working, um, but they can also understand the logic of how these things work inside Dynamo as well. Um, but I'll probably move on to custom packages after this as well. So I think um, the player version I had there, this was the one I was just um, working on before. Um, and the reason I really like the script is it's quite a simple script in principle that solves a really common problem um, that saves a lot of time. So definitely one of the best uh, use cases for Dynamo that I use to sell the concept of Dynamo to clients working with documentation. Um, it's a really quick and easy sell. So now, um, because I added that user message, I should see what's happened um, before it finishes as well. Um, but as well as that, we can run the, um, the super duper version, which is uh, essentially the data shapes version. If no one, if, if people haven't seen data shapes before, this will probably look pretty cool. Um, otherwise, you know, you've probably seen it before, but essentially it gives you a, a proper user interface separate to Dynamo Player. And one thing I really like about this is that you can essentially separate um, the inputs reliance in Dynamo um, because you're really forced to uh, assume that the user knows that they have to open the inputs tab to run this script. Um, otherwise, they'll just hit play and you might have some default inputs that are really undesirable that might actually cause a lot of problems um, in the model if they're run as is. Um, I love data shapes because it really forces the user to stop and make some choices about what they're going to do. Obviously a little bit slower uh, potentially because they do have to navigate. Um, but in this case, notice I'm not using a sheet set. Now I can go and actually pick very particular sheets um, in my model. For example, maybe I just want to apply this to my general arrangement sheets and I can just add them or remove them. I think I've already added them. So what I'll do is just I'll remove them in this case. And there we go, it's been removed from four sheets. Um, so in this case, it doesn't look like it. Interesting, I, I did very quickly just tweak this one at the last minute. Um, so that there is a chance that maybe I've missed a, missed a connection in the script. So I essentially substituted out some old nodes with some, some custom nodes from my own package. Um, so trust me in that it usually does work. I just might have potentially, uh, I think in this case, I've actually potentially connected these incorrectly. Yeah, bear with me. I mean, I guess the logic is captured there, but it seems like something I'm in the wrong script. <laughs> that probably helps. So in this case, um, I think it's this one here. Yeah, so I think it looks like it should work, but I think I've made an error somewhere in here in the logic of the way I've run the script. Um, but it's the same logic. It's more about collecting the inputs that I guess I really wanted to reinforce there. Um, but I guess I'm going one step beyond this. Uh, one thing you've probably noticed is I am relying a lot on nodes from uh, my own custom package. Um, I have really taken it upon myself to start developing um, a lot of custom functions 
uh, in Dynamo. And there's heaps of other really fantastic custom packages out there already. Um, you can see a lot of them here. Um, some of my nodes do things that these custom packages do as well, um, or do it slightly differently. Um, for example, the, the UI messenger I built in, the ability to pass through an input as well. I did actually notice later on that there was a, a node inside Rhythm that's also able to do this as well. I just hadn't noticed it before. So often, um, you know, I'll build something and then find out that another package had it. But um, the way that I build it is I always try to keep my node exposed. Um, whereas a lot of these packages don't actually expose their Python code. They usually um, build it using C, uh, C, uh, C++ and, and Visual Studio. Um, which makes the node slightly more efficient, but it means you can't see how the node is working. Um, having said that, a lot of package managers put their raw code on GitHub, um, so you can still see how the node works if you know how to how to read C. Um, but I do aim to at least expose pretty much all my Python um, in my nodes, um, just to help other people learn about how these things work, and just to try to capture a lot of really essential functions um, in one place. Um, but I do also find that one really cool thing about custom nodes is you can also just develop them for your company. You don't have to publish them online. So if your company has a lot of things that they do quite often um, that aren't really that useful outside your company, you can still build a lot of really handy nodes. So for example, at this 300 plus company I'm, I'm subconsulting for, I am developing them some custom nodes that really only suit their workflows. Um, I'll show you a couple of examples of nodes that really probably benefit me more than everyone else, but sort of might benefit some people as well. If I'm going to import uh, some Excel data into Dynamo, for example, um, it's a pretty slow, clunky process. Now, I've already found my, my super duper node, so I sort of spoiled my own, spoiled my own surprise there, um, but I'll just do it the normal way for now and just show you how much easier a custom node can make it, um, especially for a basic user. So what I might do is just boot up Excel, make some pretty raw data. Um, so I'll just, in this case, I'll just go, uh, A1, B1, um, um, and I'll just make a couple of these. And I'll probably just add a header. So I'm just going to go, um, I'm just going to go H1, H2, H3. Um, so in this case, I'm just going to save this as a new Excel file. So pretty much there's, there's, there's some things that I found I was always doing when I imported an Excel file to Dynamo. Um, I mean, the first thing that always annoyed me and a lot of other people probably too, is a lot of people just go to get a file path for their Excel file. And they want to just go and plug it into the import Excel. And already you've made your first mistake. Um, you actually need to turn it into a file object. And a lot of people in Dynamo won't understand why or what that object even is. This is actually a piece of text. It's a file path that's really text. And then you feed that text into a path which generates a file object uh, that Dynamo can understand. Um, so already some people are already probably like lost if they're new in Dynamo. So that's already one step I didn't really like. Um, on top of that, you need to pick the sheet name as well. Um, by default, it doesn't know that the most common sheet name in every Excel file in the world um, in English is sheet one, um, because most people don't change the default. Beyond this as well, um, I believe the defaults are applied for read and show Excel, which is good. But in this case, sheet name wasn't a default node. Um, so in this case, you can see that these values by default are just going to be false and true. So we're not going to read as strings and we are going to show Excel. Um, commonly, I don't usually show Excel. I find that it's easier just to have Dynamo focused on the file instead. Um, so by default, some of these things just don't really do what I wanted them to do. As well as this, the first thing we usually do with an Excel file is we drop the header rows. Uh, now, we don't necessarily always have one header row as well. So a really common thing I see people do is they use the rest of items node um, to just get rid of the first item in the list altogether. Um, two problems there. First of all, you've already lost your headers. Your headers are just out of the picture. Um, so if you want to reference a header by name, you need to go and use more nodes. Um, on top of that, you may have more than one header row, right? Um, not necessarily every file starts with just one row straight into the data. You might have um, some title rows at the top or you might have some empty rows. Uh, so what I found I was more often than not doing um, was doing a drop items and also doing a take items. And essentially just um, using these to, to um, break out these two sections of my, of my Excel table. And now at the moment, we should be taking the first item and dropping the first item. So we have our headers and we have our data. And often from here, we do um, transpose. So we flip this data so that our rows and our columns switch positions. Um, and now we're ready to work with our Excel data. 
So just in that process, I've used one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight nodes. Um, and most of this I'm going to do every time. Um, so I just decided one day to, to go, you know what, I just want to go quick, quick import Excel, file path, done. My Excel data is ready. My headers and my data are ready to go. Um, I captured all these things as inputs, obviously, but but really um, I just saved myself a lot of time down the line. Uh, maybe other people as well, if they find they're always doing that. Um, so some things are default now, for example, by default, it just says sheet one, unless you say something different, it's not gonna read a strings, it's not gonna show Excel. It's gonna drop one header row, it's gonna transpose the data as true. Um, I also added another function so that you can replace null data. So if there's fields that are empty, um, you're not going to get these really awful pieces of data called nulls in Dynamo, which actually cause errors the next time they go onto another node. Um, instead, you can just substitute them with something like an empty field or an empty list. Um, so th this is sort of like one of the, the merits of custom nodes I found, and they don't have to be that complicated. You don't have to use Python necessarily. Um, they can just package uh, things that you find yourself doing very often. Um, for example, I'm really just collecting my inputs to a normal import Excel node. Um, and in this case, just using a take and a drop, um, also using an if condition and checking if everything is null and then just replacing those nulls using uh, the standard if node, which works quite well for this. Um, it works with any shape of data, essentially. Um, and then just potentially transposing. In this case, I'm transposing and also not transposing and just using a, a, a Python script, a um, very small one. It's literally just a Python if statement. If this, give me the first thing, otherwise give me the second thing. Um, so I find that this can be like a really valuable way just to package really repetitive things that you find your company doing. Um, but not only that, you can you can use it to really capture the way that your scripts work and deploy it across the company. So if you have a package available um, as a folder that can be copied into the packages director on any computer, uh, potentially using a batch script or something that can automate that process, um, you really can just make sure that everyone's up to date with custom functions in the company without um, having them rely on online packages as well. I find that can be really challenging, uh, especially if people are just um, downloading the latest version every time, because a lot of packages do change quite frequently. Um, even my own, I'm quite guilty of changing my, node, my nodes um, quite often. Um, so in this case, another really good example I like to use for a really simple custom node that just makes sense is um, I found that I was always taking my sheets and building a sheet, a sheet name out of them uh, for printing. And I was doing this in quite a lot of scripts. And I have a very specific system that I use, um, but I thought, you know, why don't I build it and then just share it with people so they can also just use, use that system if they want as well. So in this case, if I just take all the sheets in my model, I'll just get a categories drop down node. Usually I use categories by name, but I'm just saving a, saving a little bit of time here. So now I'm probably speeding through this quite quickly. Um, but I also have an optional prefix. Um, so in this case, I'll just leave the prefix as um, I'll do BG underscore for BIM Guru, just a bit of shameless self-promotion. Um, and in this case, the separator I use by default is a dash um, with a space. And in this case, um, I had the option to also include the revision of the sheet. And what I get on the back end is not only the sheets themselves, but I get a formatted sheet name that can be applied um, to a to a, say a batch print function, say in Revit 2022. Uh, where we can actually batch print using Dynamo um, using the native export PDF function. So um, whilst it may not necessarily serve everyone some use in the industry, you can imagine inside a company itself um, just having a node like this that captures uh, a lot more steps. Um, in this case, I did most of this in the design script block. Um, it, it really does package a lot of that workflow into something that a user uh, can much more easily understand and it gives them a lot more trust in Dynamo and just how suitable it can be for their needs. Um, and I find this is also a good step that sort of prompts discussion with the users where they actually start identifying the way that Dynamo works and they start feeling more comfortable requesting uh, features and, and things that they can actually have out of Dynamo, um, which is really essential for the culture of, of computation and Dynamo to take off inside a company. Um, but having said that, a lot of nodes do get a lot more complex. So they're not necessarily easy. For example, I have one um, in this case for uh, floors and in this case this is um this is workable in revit 2022 and can generate floors with holes in them it's quite a new feature um, it actually takes a, a list of curves um, i'm not actually in revit 2022 so this node won't work if i try to run it um yeah, and I sorry to cut in uh yeah. from the studio so 
I think this is the most interesting thing ever, but in order to get some of our uh, our first semesters and our, our younger students to actually give a damn about Dynamo, like when... Like we do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. How, how do you see yourself, like, when you came to, to all these companies working at the Boom Manager and everything, uh, yeah, so the context, yeah. and actually teaching them about it and saying this is like this is hello world my first script like how do you oh get yeah hello world yeah I've got, I've got um probably the perfect hello world um sorry sorry I didn't I didn't realize I was probably going so far past I, I get way too excited with Dynamo sometimes oh and I do as well that's why I'm really loving it, it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, hello world is hello world is very essential I mean I have a literal hello world I can probably quickly show you that doesn't even really use the Revit model, but then I have a Revit model Hello World that I like to use. Um, so I guess going back a step, I mean, the, the Hello World we could use is we just literally ignore all these custom packages uh, and we just start up here. Um, so it, all I'm going to do in this case is take some pieces of data. Um, in this case, I'm going to take some basic data. You can see things like true and false, uh, integers and numbers, um, strings. I'm just going to take uh, probably three strings. Um, so let's just uh, literally put in the word hello. Let's put in uh, world with an exclamation mark. And um, in this case, let's look for something we can join these together with. Uh, so we'll go for math uh, functions. And you'll start to see a lot of things that you recognize in here. And I think I'm looking for operators actually. So these are things you'll recognize even if you don't really understand programming like plus, minus, um, divide, multiply. Uh, some of these might not necessarily use symbols that you recognize, um, so you might not be used to seeing such as a uh, exclamation mark equals, which means something is not equal to something. So um, that's more of a programming term, but you will start to see some like plus, for example. Um, we can take this piece of data and add it to this piece of data. Um, I'm going to just use a node called watch, which shows us what's happened. And you start to see now, um, I'm not pointing to the current document, I'll just close this other file. But you'll start to see the concept of data flow in actions. So we've taken two pieces of data, joined them together, and the result uh, should hopefully, hopefully show up. I, think I might potentially need to, potentially need to reopen the script. I think because I was pointing to another document, it's freaked it out a little bit. Um, this is like a literal hello world, but I do have more of a, a Revit specific example. Hopefully this works now. There we go. So we can see now that we've combined these two pieces of, of text into one statement, um, literally a hello world. Um, but I guess in this case, notice we don't have a space between them. Uh, so we don't just necessarily have to limit ourselves to one function. We can actually take um, more data. So let's take say a space. And first we'll just add a space to hello take another plus node, and now we're going to take that result and then add world on the end. And now we should have um, two stages in a computational workflow. So you can really order your data um, in many steps to achieve what we would call a, a script uh, that really has uh, inputs, functions and methods, and an output or a goal. Um, now this is obviously something you wouldn't use in Revit. Um, you know, it's very often it's, it's never common that you're trying to say hello to your Revit model unless it's freezing and maybe you're just trying to get it to wake up. Um, but what I usually like to show people as, I guess, a more literal uh, Revit hello world is let's actually look at elements in our BIM model instead. So let's say in our BIM model, um, we have lots of elements. We have things like walls, we have rooms, we have roofs, all sorts of things. Um, let's in this case maybe look at all the rooms in our model. So in this case, um, you can see that all my rooms are uppercase. Um, let's say maybe the client says, I don't like uppercase rooms, they're very angry. Um, all capital letters, very scary. So we wanna have the first letter as upper and the rest as lower. Um, so how could we do this? Well, obviously I could go on tab select, modify the name manually over and over and over again. This model is quite small, but maybe it's a hospital with thousands of rooms. Um, obviously, you're not going to want to do this manually, and you could use something like a third-party plugin uh, that can do this, um, either a free one or a paid one, uh, but maybe the machines don't have this available. Well, the great thing about Dynamo is it's available in pretty much every build of Revit since, I think, 2017, and it's built uh, into Revit and tied to the build since Revit 2020. Um, so it is a tool that you can really reliably just assume most computers with Revit are going to have available. Um, and if you build scripts the right way, 
you don't really need any deployment uh, to run these scripts. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to get a category. Now there's there's all sorts of places in the library you can retrieve these things from. I'm probably just going to search for them just to save a little bit of time. Um, but pretty much everything you see me use is going to come with Dynamo by default. Um, so I'm going to pick a category and straight away you'll see um, things that you recognize in Revit. These are all the categories in a Revit model. So I'm going to go down to R for rooms. And I'm going to obtain uh, the rooms category. And now I'm going to actually convert these to elements in Dynamo so that we now have some data that we can pass across what we call the Dynamo canvas where we're working. So I'm going to get all elements of a category. And what we should get on the back end of this, if I get a watch note just to see what we're dealing with, is we now have um, all the rooms in our remote model. Um, you can see here that we have an ID number as well. This is that number in green. Um, so if I do go to 3462402, and I select uh, by ID, uh, I think it's 3462402, if I remember right. And there we go. We can see that that is actually that room um, in Dynamo that we can work with now. So we can do things like take properties of that element. We can set properties of that element. Um, this is usually where I begin with Dynamo because um, usually a lot of the workflows we use in Dynamo rely on changing the properties of elements. So in this case, um, I'm just going to go back to Dynamo. And in this case, we can just get something about the element. Let's get its name. I'm just going to look for room name just on a whim just to see if there's something there. And sure enough, there's a node for the name of a room. And if I watch the output of this node, we should see that now for each room, we get its name. So we have 30 rooms and 30 names in the same order. Um, so our data is now running in parallel, which means we can do things to it whilst potentially working with the original elements that we used in the first place. Um, so what I'm going to do now is probably just quickly show you data types because that's important to understand as well. So data can be transformed into lots of different types in Dynamo, depending on what it is. For example, here we have elements. So if I just check its type, we'll see that those elements are rooms. So it understands it's a Revit room. Um, what about their name? What's that? Well, in this case, this is actually a string, which is essentially the programmatic term for text um, to some degree. It's not quite, that's not quite correct. So if any programmers are out there, I know that's not quite true. Um, it's just a really simple way of putting it. Um, so in this case, let's just work with our room names as text. And maybe in this case, um, I'll just see if I have a node for proper case. Um, I think proper case or title case. I think this might be from a custom package potentially. Yes, it is. It's from a custom package called Rhythm, um, which is developed by someone over in America uh, that you can install on your machine. Now, there are some by default, such as um, upper and lower, um, that actually just uh, work by default. Uh, but some of these are built by, by other custom developers. I'm just going to use this custom one for now uh, just to get what we want. So this is actually going to transform those room names, uh, which should actually, to title case. I might just firstly convert it to lowercase because um, I think I might need to do that first. Yeah, so there you go. So now you can see that name has now been turned into uh, lowercase. Now back in Dynamo, uh, back in Revit, sorry, nothing's happened yet. We're just dealing with data in Dynamo right now. So um, so for now, we haven't actually done done anything yet. Um, if I think I think now if I put it into a title case node, yes, there we go. Now it finds the first letter of every um every name and uppercases it. So now this is essentially what we want to call our rooms. This will meet the client's request. So um I'm just gonna look for a node in this case called set parameter parameter value by name. Um, I'm, I'm using a lot of nodes that you'll sort of pick up as you learn Dynamo um, from various learning resources. Uh, but in this case, it expects a few things. So this node's a little bit more complicated. It expects elements, um, a parameter name to set, and the value that we want to set. Um, so each element in Dynamo actually has a lot of parameters available to work with. So let's just have a look at the parameters of these elements. So I can see I've actually generated a lot of data there. I now have um, 1,770 pieces of data because for each room, I've essentially looked at all the data it has available. And I can start to look at the names and the values of the parameters contained in that element. So I'm actually accessing a heap of data about this element, things like its area, its name, its number. Um, but in this case, I'm just looking for this name because I want to know what name of the parameter I want to set, which in this case is just, it's just name. So I'm going to take my original rooms. 
So remember, we've just been working with text, but this text is all still parallel to the original elements that we took that name from. So this is going to be the value that I set them to. And finally, I'm just going to get a string so that I can type in the name of the parameter that we want to set. Name. And now we get to see the, the fruit of our, our efforts pay off. Now, remember, this could be like a, a 2000 room project and we might have just saved ourselves a lot of time. But if I run this, uh, just keep an eye on the room names. I get an error <laughs> because I've done something. Done something wrong, haven't I? I think that's probably like the, the biggest <laughs> letdown I have as well. Whenever I'm building a script or doing anything, it's just ending up in that null value or ending up in that um, press and run. That's that's a weird one. I didn't expect that to cause an error. That's very interesting. <laughs> Name is usually a very accessible parameter. I might just um, give Dynamo a reboot and just make sure that I haven't potentially phased it out. But you are right that a lot of the time Dynamo does require a deep understanding of troubleshooting and almost knowing why uh, why yeah. it's going wrong. Yeah. Uh, that I think that's right. all. I think that's also the like a uh, question we had. Um, how can this be? Because uh, that makes it really uncomfortable for a lot of people and uh, the the entry really hard for people in exactly, the industry. Exactly. Yeah. It's very difficult. Um. I guess for for an absolute beginner. Uh, to approach Dynamo um, with, with also with no programming knowledge. That's how I actually began with Dynamo. Um, and, and of course, I, I went through a lot of periods of frustration and, and not, not quite giving up, but as good as giving up um, and having to come back to it. And, and I found that the, the, the thing that really spurred me forward or motivated me was finding a problem that I really couldn't solve without, um, without computation. And that sort of encouraged me to get through uh, the frustration hurdles of pro the program not doing what I necessarily wanted it to do. But uh, I guess seeing myself getting closer and closer through each error that I sort of solved or figured out, um, and, and that sort of motivated me closer towards towards my goal. Um, but yeah, it, it can be a little bit frustrating, um, especially in the early phases, trying to trying to figure out why it's just not doing what you want it to but do. But for the people... It's for the people with a high frustrating tolerance, right? So... Um, oh, I mean, I to, guess... To uh, I guess hopefully... Hopefully you have a fairly yeah. high frustration tolerance heading into the yeah. AC industry. <laughs> I, I think a, everybody you know, needs it. Yeah. In a lot of ways. No, yeah. no, the, the, the question is like, what would you suggest? Because we're like in an education situation here, right? Yes. Um, how to integrate this uh, into the education that uh, there is some basic knowledge uh, or basic understanding of um, of uh, programming and uh, that in in the industry so that now the young students uh, getting into into have an easier way to get into this, um, like to, to take yeah. this frustration out of it's the way. It's a great question. I mean, it's it's very relevant to me because I'm actually teaching university myself at the moment and trying to find some some basic examples of computation. I can show my students, uh, and I found typically, um, I mean, I, I usually begin them just by giving them scripts that I've already built that they can run. Um, that we can look at together and, and follow along through the data flow um, rather than forcing them to have to search through libraries and navigate user interfaces that they're not, they're not familiar with. Um, we start more with the principles on the canvas itself. Um, and, and, you know, we start with the very basic workflow. So, so data manipulation is, is probably the first thing I teach them and then filtering data. So working with, um, with data rather than necessarily going to really complicated workflows like, say, solar analysis. Um, environmental feasibility studies. Um, I, I find that usually starting them with the concept of data is most important um, and always tying it back to uh, use cases is, is really essential. Otherwise, um, you know, they don't see the use for it or it doesn't encourage them to, to really push forward with it because it seems like it only solves like a very small amount of the potential of what they might run into. Um, it, it is seriously challenging for a student to context contextualize uh, the need because I guess um, once you go out in the industry, you'll see a different side of the way that the delivery processes we use work yeah. and many of the inefficiencies that they contain as well. Um, and that's really where I found Dynamo has got the most power. Uh, whereas um, if you're doing things like feasibility competitions, um, I do use a lot of Grasshopper and a little bit of Rhino inside instead because that program better handles geometry. Um, but you're almost learning less about data and more about transformation of shapes and geometry um, using still the principles of visual coding, uh, but in a very different way. So I think it depends on the student. I, I do show my students both Grasshopper and Dynamo, um, and I usually do begin them with this example. I'm still not quite sure why it didn't work, but 
Um, I guess uh, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Um, it sort of sort of scares me it didn't work because it's a very it's a very simple workflow, so it makes me think something's wrong <laughs> with the um, with the model. Um, but I guess um, th this would be the first workflow I, I nearly would ever show anyone using Dynamo, just because I think we've.